This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you, Savannah. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. Really happy to be here. My first time in Ithaca. I have friends, collaborators here, and, and have been having just a great time meeting with the students and, and faculty. So thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, so I, I thought about talking a little bit about what I've done so far in my efforts to breed potato and sweet corn, which are very different crops that probably share starch only. And as far as breeding goes, I thought I would start mostly for the students. There we go. Just a, a little bit of, as, as Savannah mentioned, a little bit of it about my career so far has been quite a bit of a zigzag. I went from a forestry background to open a, a genomics company and run that as a business, and then became a sweet corn breeder, and then now a potato breeder. And I think that the, hopefully the, the message here that I, I, I encourage at least my students to reflect is that you don't ever know where you end up. So hopefully your classes and your colleagues and, and talks on different crops or different methods, uh, you can appreciate that because I certainly didn't know I would be a, end up being a potato or a sweet corn breeder. It's worth saying that I came from a bit of a farming background. I, I grew corn in the past, but the very first pollination of corn I've done myself was after I was in the job already. And actually Jeannie was one at Bill Trace's lab. They, they were actually helping me uh, learn that. And the very first potato pollination I've done was after I had already decided to, to start this, this effort. So there's definitely quite a bit of learning that is still ongoing on my end, and I think that will continue for a while. Um, but with that, I hope to just share a little bit of uh, my, my lab mission nowadays is, is very much the reason why I, I came back to UF and, and what I do, what I do, I want to first and foremost breed and, and at least tentatively develop varieties that are relevant. I get to growers, both in the corn and potatoes. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, how I go about that. Um, it's only been the program, the corn program is about four years old. The, the potato program is about three years old. So I don't really have any varieties yet, but that's, that's very much what drives a lot of my decisions when it comes to research projects and whatnot. And it's usually a combination between field breeding and quantitative genetics and genomics, which are my um, training expertise. Um, I am generally interested too in, in understanding the genetic basis of corn or potatoes, natural diversity, uh, interested in develop new technologies that can translate to basically improve efficiency or improve the breeding processing in general. And then very much one of the, the decision factors to come back to academia was to interact and, and, and train and mentor if possible, the next generation of, of plant breeders. So I definitely appreciate all the meetings I've had so far and, and they all have been wonderful. So the way, formally speaking, the way my position is divided in Florida, I have about 80% of my time that goes to research. And in my mind, I divide that time in what I call the operational breeding research, which is just the routine breeding and getting basically across the selection and just the regular process that takes place in the breeding program. And then a lot of the applied research is thinking on tools, methods, uh, science that can hopefully make my operational process better and faster and easier to do. So that's how I go about a lot of the thinking. Although every once in a while there, we have, I have a few basic projects that I cannot see a direct application for this, but uh, anyways. So, so the way I kind of structured this presentation was very much talk a little bit about the two breeding programs, more the, the routine and the, the operational part of it very briefly, just to give you a sense of what we're doing in corn and in potatoes. And then mention a, a, a few projects that we're working on that I think could have direct impact uh, in, in the program. So to start about sweet corn, sweet corn is an important, is a quintessential vegetable uh, all over US. Florida is one of the main producers for fresh market sweet corn. A few years ago, it was number one in the country. And then nowadays, it oscillates with California and, G and Georgia. So sometimes we're number two, sometimes we're number three. Um, so it turns out that actually Florida was quite, quite important when it comes to sweet corn breeding. Back in the days, the program started in 1956 by Emma Wolf. 
And Emil was the first one who, he didn't really discover shrunken tube, but he got this gene, shrunken tube, and, and put into subtropical backgrounds and developed hybrids and inbreds that contain this mutation in this gene and they increase quite a bit sugar content. So shrunken tube is now the predominant mutation by which every single, almost virtually 100% of the sweet corn that you buy in the supermarket, fresh market sweet corn, uh, has this shrunken tube mutation. And Emil created these hybrids back in 77, which were plantly widely in, in not only in Florida, but in Thailand and in all over the globe. And he really revolutionized the industry. But after he left in the 90s, the, the program is slowed down. And for the last 15 to 20 years when I joined, it was, by, it was being maintained in a fairly small state. Germplasm was available, but it was, uh, there were a couple releases for inbreds in 2012, uh, but not, not a lot of collaboration with companies. So a lot of my goal when I, when I came to this program was to, okay, we have good germplasm, we have growers, we have demand. How do I just scale this up to actually have a breeding pipeline and hopefully increase the number of releases that will become uh, hybrids. So the, the program is an inbred development program. So if you think about corn breeding, if you have the, the two heterotic groups, we only work on one side of the equation. So we develop finished inbreds every year. And generally nowadays about 200, 250 finished inbreds per year. And, and then all of our selection is done in collaboration with companies via test crosses. So that's why I mentioned that part of my goal was to increase collaboration, to increase the number of test crosses combination that I can evaluate. And so every year we plant anywhere between 1,000 and 1,500 test cross hybrids in growers' fields, in growers' conditions, and use this as the initial selection uh, for our inbreds. So if a, if a hybrid is selected, it keeps moving into the selection pipeline where it gets evaluated for one more year and eventually it gets into the company's testing network for uh, ideally for eventually release. And we have a few of those that are nowadays tested for two, three years already. So hopefully, maybe if I come back in, in a few years, I'll have more, more to share that um, about that. But also the phenotypic evaluation that we collect in the test crosses go back to guide what we recombine in our inbreds. We mostly select females, and that's just based on the dynamics of, of how the companies, they have very good male materials, they want female corn traits, and so we mostly focus on that. Um, in the potatoes, and, and I'll, get, I'll get back to corn later on, but that's just sort of the routine that goes on every year. In the potato side, well, potato is the most number one vegetable consumed in the country, and it turns out, I don't know how many of you knew that, but Florida is actually fairly important when it comes to potato production, mainly because we get a potato uh, a production window that is much earlier than the rest of the country. So plants are in the ground right now. Um, so about 36 of the national production during the winter, 36% of the national production during winter and spring, they actually come to Florida Growers do get premium pricing because they're producing at a time where there's not a lot of potatoes in the market. So it's about a $200 million industry that goes $150, $200 million industry for the state. And it makes it a, a fairly important crop. However, um, while there is a lot of effort in public breeding of potatoes, including that Cornell has a, a strong program, as I, I, I imagine you can at least imagine that there is quite a bit of GBAE between Florida and the states in the north. And hopefully you can see this in this paper, it's not very big, but this was a paper from, led by Jeff Endelman and, and others, just looking at um, same, same set of varieties evaluated in different states. And Florida is very much the outlier when it comes to GBAE, which is no surprise. Day length is different, soil is very different. We plant in the cold and we harvest in the, in the heat. So it's basically May. It's already the beginning of the summer for us. Uh, heat tolerance is a big trait that is typically not a problem in any other program. So a lot of people ask me, okay, why did you go from breeding sweet corn to potatoes? And a lot of it was sort of this discussion that started about how there, is, there was a stakeholder demand. We got about 30,000 acres of potato grown in the state. 
we thought there was an opportunity to actually create impact and select varieties adapted to Florida, which in itself, there's a huge subtropical and tropical market elsewhere in the world as well. And in, in, in this process, and I'll mention that in a minute, there was quite a bit of knowledge of potato production in Florida. And a lot of the breeding efforts are, are being done in collaboration with colleagues who grow potatoes routinely. I will also mention about that, that there was availability of elite uh, and adapted germplasm. So we weren't really starting from scratch. And, and, and that was a big deciding factor because if I wanted to make progress in a 10 to 20 year time span, I, I think it was important for me to start with, uh, with elite materials. So, so with that, we put together a program that is looking at conventional traits that all the other breeders are, but also uh, heat tolerance. That's probably one of the main drivers of GBAE in Florida and some nutrient efficiency. So what do I mean by a, a, the availability of germplasm? While we have never done, the UF has never had a potato program, breeding program, he has had a potato variety evaluation program for more than 20 years. So what that means is if you think about the, the breeding funnel, usually the potatoes will go to the field. And this is more like year two, but year one in the field, there is a strong selection intensity in years one and two, usually anywhere between one and 3% in each of these years. But at year three, breeders have enough seeds, and by seeds, I mean tubers, enough seeds to distribute to several states to do multi-environment trials. So for the last 20 years, we've actually have been a testing network for these uh, materials. So we had a database of potatoes that were adapted to Florida. Many times they may or not have been selected by the breeders because of GBAE. If you look at it and they're, they were good in, in the North and, or they were good in Florida and not good as, elsewhere, it got tossed. But more than that, there's a whole set of 99% of discarded potatoes that never got evaluated because years one and two are done in their home, home states, right? Um, so, so with that, what, what we put together was collaborated with a lot of the other public breeders to use these selected materials as uh, starting points, as parents in the program. And now this was already ran. So the, the part of the pipeline for phenotyping, data collection, evaluation was already in place. And then we introduced sort of the early stages where we now produce about 10,000 seedlings. Uh, that comes out of about 75 crosses. We generate four tubers per seedling. So these are clonal clones, clonal uh, uh, plants. So they go into year one with about 40,000 mini tubers. We're doing about three to 10% in selection intensity on year two. And then, uh, and then you go on with the next steps of the breeding program, which are just, uh, this is not, doesn't depart very much to what others are done. And I'll mention later on, on how we're thinking about applying GS here. So that's kind of the nitty gritty of the two programs. And, and I'm, I'm definitely having a lot of fun. Someone asked me today over lunch is like things that get me excited. And to me, every time, you do a selection or you generate a new crosses between two selected lines and you got to wait till the next season to see how well that goes. That keeps the excitement going, right? So that's something that is exciting to me. Um, there is another piece that I wanted to mention to, to most of the students is that there are a lot of little micro decisions that go on, honestly, in any research program, but, but sp specifically in the breeding program that often don't get uh, disgusting talks. And I just wanted to showcase one, for example, on how to balance theory and what we learn in classes and, and the, the practicalities of it. So most of the potato breeders in the country, they would actually produce um, one tuber per seedling. So what that means is you generate a cross, you generate several true potato seeds, so actual seeds, and then you need to produce tubers from those seeds to take it to the field. So the easiest way to do that is to use a small uh, pots, right, trays that fit a lot of samples, and then you have one tuber, a single, in, a single plant, and then you take that tuber to year one in the field as a single unreplicated plant and make a selection, mass selection, phenotypic base in the field. 
Uh, and one of the, I think one of the only exceptions to that was actually Walter here in Cornell, which took the effort to use larger pots, produce four mini tubers, and then you take to the field on year one, there is still an unreplicated single plot because the logistics of uh, creating replicates for these four just would make it too complicated. But to me, and I don't have data to support that, but it seems logical that the heritability of the selection there with four uh, units of selection will be much higher. And that was something that we did. And again, those are the small little details when setting up the program that the drawback of that is that it takes a lot more space and a lot more effort. So where we can fit 36 plants in a tray, we're now fitting 15, right? So there's a lot more work that goes on to, to produce these. And we'll see if it pay off or not. Maybe we'll never know because we had to make a decision. We'll do one or the other, right? So, um, but, but these are something that I think are, are interested. And when I, interesting. And when I think a, a lot about not only these little decisions, but also the research pro, pro, programs, I think a lot about like genetic gain, right? So a lot of what I've been doing in the two programs are, Okay, what, what can I do? Well, routes to genetic gain is just practical routes, right? When you think about intensity of selection, variability, time, well, some of these practical routes would be, I can just increase the program size. Figure out funding, hire people, and easier said than done, right? Uh, figure out mechanization for harvest and whatnot, and that would, the same selection intensity would just increase the number of candidates. A lot of what we're trying to do is, more accurate selection, increasing the heritability, um, improving phenotyping, improving phenotyping, the traits that are important, doing better experimental designs, always balancing the, the, the practicality and the logistics of it with the theory. But that was just an example now. And again, I still have four, uh, an unreplicated plot, but at least I definitely have better, uh, higher heritabilities there. And, and when possible, we haven't done that much about this yet, but we're still exploring marker assist selection for some key uh, traits. Um, we've been doing work with faster breeding cycles, so um, more seasons per year. This was, again, just some of these logistics decisions that we changed in the program. Double haploid production in sweet corn was not used very much, and we're now using quite a bit. So you go straight from an F1 or F2 to a, to a DH inbred, which just accelerates the production and genomic prediction, and I'll show some data about that. And then exploring adequate genetic variability, and, and that's something that I saw early on in, in our materials of corn, when I looked at heritabilities of, in the exact same environments, phenotyped in the exact same day by the exact same people, the heritability of our own material compared to heritability, for example, of Bill Tracy's programs, ours were much lower as a consequence of us having less genetic, diverse, genetic variability there. So over the time, basically just selection intensity reduced variability, and this is something that we've been putting time on. So again, those are a little bit of the sort of more operational uh, points of what we've been spending time on. But what I think perhaps you would be more interested in hearing, and, and I'll, I'll mention three different projects that the lab is working on. And, and one is our efforts with genomics. Talk a little bit about GWAS and genomic selection. Um, a tool that I'm particularly excited uh, with in our program, which is phenomic selection, and then a little bit of work in, in some optimization and mate allocation. So, as, as I mentioned, the, the, I joined UF about seven years ago, and there was a transition internally until I had access to germplasm and started the program effectively. So for the first three years or so, I was mostly generating genomic resources and, and honestly learning quite a bit about the crop myself. Um, so we, we sequenced in collaboration with Mike Orr, uh, we sequenced the, the sweet corn genome. This was prior to the NAM, at least the effort started and it was published right around the same time, but prior to the NAM line sequenced. So Vincent also worked on that. Where is this? Yeah. Um, so that was quite a fun project to actually explore a little bit of population genomics and uh, create a reference genome for sweet corn. And then we went on to uh, established this diversity panel for, there are about 700 sweet corn lines. We think they capture pretty much all of the sweet corn diversity. Um, and, and then there was USDA funding to sequence, whole genome sequencing, 
the, the 700 lines, we did about 9x coverage. Most of them are inbred. There are some uh, land races and heterozygous materials which got sequenced the same amount. And after some filtering, we end up with about 28 million uh, variants. And there's quite a bit more I can talk about that. For sake of time, if, if you have questions, I can go more into this. But the, the population divides into groups um, that it was actually quite cool to see that in each of the, in many of these structured groups, we, we see filler land races that were known to be important back in the late 1800s for sweet corn breeding. Um, Golden Bantam, Stowell's Evergreen, for those of you that are familiar with some of these lines, we see them represented in these different groups. Keep in mind that genetic diversity in sweet corn is much smaller than, say, in field corn, for example, in regular corn. And so a lot of what we want to explore with this data was to use, and, and I, I try to do my best to move back and forth between corn and potatoes here. So I'll show some data on potato too, but, but was to basically use these genotypes and a variety of phenotypes that were collected, both for genome-wide association studies and for genomic selection. So I'll start with, with GWAS first. And, and I must say, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with it. I think there's several traits and several situations where you find textbook examples, very cool, clear biology that needs to be validated, but it really makes a lot of sense. And just the, the power you have for GWAS in structured breeding populations. We were talking about this over lunch. I don't think we'll ever compare with, for example, what's been done in humans. So, so there are a lot of cases where either we don't find anything or there's a lot of GBAE. You run three years of data. Each year you get a different result. And, and anyways, it makes it for a fun exercise. But I'll show you, firstly, the most interesting ones. Uh, one of the traits that's really important in sweet corn is germination. The seed itself has very little starch. So we need uh, germination rates, even in elite commercial hybrids, they often are not as high. They're not, often not 100% or anywhere close to it. And we spend quite a bit of time uh, phenotyping uh, for germination rates, not only in, in regular field conditions, but under cold. Sent, every year we send these materials to Washington State and they get planted there under cold. We had some, gro some automated growth, uh, growth chamber assays. And, and this is one result that came out. Again, I'm showing you the, the nicest ones. I'll show you some of the ugly ones later on. But there was a, a single nice peak. The top snip created a stop codon, was inside a gene, created a stop codon in that gene. That gene was on, annotated as a gibberellin regulated protein 8. It is expressed in the embryo and in the endosperm. There is protein accumulation in the embryo. There's a lot of things playing in our favor here. We haven't really done the actual validation yet, but at least everything makes sense. You look into the neighboring genes, there's really nothing else that looks like a candidate. So I think that's one that potentially it's quite exciting. There's another one, and just to mention a few of the phenotypes, we generated something like in, collectively the entire group generated something like 150 different phenotypes. So this was done in collaboration with Anna Block from USDA. And what Anna did is an, is an assay where you subject plants to a fall armyworm assay. So this is an insect that's really uh, important in sweet corn because there's, no, there's not a lot of GMO sweet corn out there. So you subject the plants to the fall armyworm and then you establish these chambers where you do headspace collection for metabolites that are triggered due to herbivory. So at the end, we had about 30 different metabolites in the, in the population. And then we did metabolite GWAS to see what were the SNPs actually affecting some of these metabolites. So here's an example for beta mercine, where again, the SNP, the top SNP in this tower was inside this gene that's called terpene synthase one. So it happened, it so happened that Anna had mutants for this gene readily available. Um, and when you look at um, the volatile production for beta mercine in TPS1 mutants, they're actually quite reduced in the mutant relative to wild type, both in normal conditions and in full armyworm uh, uh, assays. And when you actually look at um, 
preferences for of a position. So you subject the, as, the, the larvae to an assay where you have both plants, wild type N and TPS1 mutants. The, it, it seems like the insect prefers less to go eat the TPS1 mutant plants. Uh, so again, another case of those that there's definitely more validation that can be done to actually confirm that's the case. But it seems like the pretty interesting results that um, may at least expand our understanding of biology here. We have a bunch of other GWAS out there, some which are good, some which are not. So a lot of the effort, I think I can go for another 100 years exploring these. And, and I must admit that there are a few candidates that we have clear loss of function or, or at least knockouts that could lead that the basically the phenotype is is the knockout is the opponent or not and we will explore doing gene editing in some of them um i, I think others are more just like about an, an exercise about improving understanding biology we've now done that in potatoes as well and here are two traits yield and specific gravity and this is really quite fresh results that came out a couple of days ago and when the student wanted to do GWAS for these traits, I told him that I, I wasn't expecting very much out of it. There are two quantitative traits. And I still need to explore exactly what's happening. So for example, for yield, <coughs> excuse me, um, we do have a nice peak that I suspect it probably has to do with maturity or, or something that's basically cluster, well clustered into, into different yield amounts. And, and we're still gonna explore this a little bit more, but, um, so that's some of the efforts about GWAS. I, I think where I'm more excited about is using this in, in the breeding in the forms of genomic selection. And if you think about a, a, a recurrent selection program, this is just a hypothetical one. So if we're generating new crosses, we can produce a certain amount of the ages. And the reality is that often I produce more double haploid lines than I have bandwidth test in test crosses. So Usually I need to do some thinning here on what goes for test crossing. And, and then once they go into TC1, on this side, not showing is the company breeding program that's running in, in parallel. So I could apply genomic selection here to guide my crosses within the, the, the heterotic group, if you will. And I'll get back to that a little bit later in the presentation. I can apply genomic selection just on a per se selection of the, of the inbred performance. And, and at the very least to narrow down which the ages or which finished inbreds go into TC evaluation. And so we've, we've done that now for, for a few years and we calibrated um, genomic selection models in the inbreds and sometimes in the hybrids, but predicting the, the inbred values. And the prediction values are, are quite high actually. In one end, it's good because it shows that we have potential to, to deploy this. Another point of view, which showcases, again, the fact that Sweetcorn has a pretty narrow, uh, quite, quite a bit structured population. Um, I'm only showing a few different traits. We have others. Yield, marketable yield is a trait that's really hard to collect in, in, in early stage Sweetcorn. So we end up generating a lot of year component traits. So year height, year length, Tip fill, how much the year fills all the way to the top, and things like that. But in addition to, to just generating these prediction models, we've also simulated our own breeding program with the exact details and sizes, and, and basically inputted the actual costs of what it would be to, to do genotyping, do genomic selection, to have basically a, a, a genomic selection program. And under different conditions, here are just different levels of G by E. And not surprising, others have shown this, many have deployed this routinely. The, the GS gains, uh, especially in our case, that we have the ability to select in off-site nurseries based on a model that predicts the target environments, which is in South Florida. So we basically gain both in, in not only in absolute gain, but in also in, in gain relative to cost, right? So this year is actually the first, um, the first year that we're past model calibration and that we're se selecting which individuals will be crossed in the program using genomic data. So we're actually deploying it routinely. And, and I'm pretty excited about that. 
So the, the, the third way that we could use GS is a little bit harder for us because a lot of people, a lot of papers show that where you can actually bypass the test crossing system and predict which combinations of hybrids should be created. For us to do that in our current system, we would need access to company's data to be able to basically see which of the company material would better complement uh, our materials. And that's a little bit harder to do. That being said, we did do that uh, in collaboration with Bill Tracy. So it's more as a demonstration to showcase to companies and, and created about 506 hybrids in, in 62 uh, combinations of 62 different inbred lines. And these have now also been phenotyped for about three different years in three different locations. We have trials in California, Florida, and Wisconsin. And once again, the, the, the prediction accuracies are pretty high. I'm showing here ear length, ear width, and, and tip fill. Um, so, so moving forward, I, I chose not to share a lot of details on the models, but these are just standard GBLOP models. The hybrid one includes a dominance kernel. The inbred per se were just a, was just an additive model. Um, so I am actually deploying these here uh, routinely for the, again, this is one side of the heterotic group, for the selection of which inbreds to recombine and to actually cull down the ages before they go into test cross generation. Okay, so that's GS in corn. Um, in potato, the accuracies were not as high, which makes a, lot more, a little bit more sense. It's more in line with what we see uh, in, in other crops. I have here marketable yield, specific gravity, and total yield. And these yield and gravity are two important traits for chipping potatoes. And at the same time, just keep in mind that once you take a potato to the field, it takes three years for you to actually have enough experimental power, enough seeds to measure specific gravity, generally speaking. So if I can predict in year one specific gravity uh, of, with a, a fairly good accuracy, it's just a clear, we, it's just an easy acceleration of the program that I think makes a lot of sense. Uh, Kelly and I were talking earlier today, that was a lot of the motivation when I started working with genomic selection in trees. Any positive non-random prediction accuracy is worth it from in my point of view, because if you're shifting the selection from year six to year to seedling, right? It's gonna make sense in the, in the program and, and, and beef cattle or dairy cattle is the same thing. So we're moving a little bit more aggressively here in this program. Uh, now we only have one year of data for this model, but what we're gonna do this year is that, so these um, seedlings, they go to the ground on year one, We'll select about 10% of them, so a little bit looser intensity of selection. And then the selected ones based on field traits get genotyped. And on year one, at the end of year one, we're already recycling new parents based on the genomic prediction and just accelerating the, the crossings. And they still go to the regular field testing program later on, but at least we have new, new parents quickly being uh, recycled. So that's, that's sort of the genomic program. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about phenomic selection, and, and there's quite a bit of phenotyping that, that we're exploring, but I, I chose to focus on one here today, which is the use of the single, the, the use of the single kernel NIR. This is a collaboration with Paul Armstrong. So this is the machine, it's a custom-made machine we have in the lab. I'll put a little video to run. So basically, this is a, the cone planter uh, cone with a vacuum tied to it. So pick up one seed at a time and then we'll drop the seed through an NIR module, which is here. And then it actually has a sorter here if you wanna sort for a certain parameter, but I'm not, what I'm gonna talk here, I'm not using the sorter very much. So initially we use this machine to do the general model calibration for NIR, just like it has been done in many other cases, right? So we, we generated ground truth wet lab data for uh, starch content, for sugar content, oil content, pear carb thickness, and, and traits related to kernel composition, and then calibrated a model, which these models tend to be pretty good. Uh, I mean, we see R squares, the kernel weight, we can predict with 0.96 R squared. They're, they're really good. But 
what what I was interested to see that's that's what I call the classical use are traits associated with the kernel and there are several papers about this. I was interested to see whether or not I could use this data for phenomic selection. So to actually build uh, a, a kinship matrix, a relationship matrix, and predict complex traits that may not be necessarily related with kernel composition. And others have done that in, in court. Uh, I think Seth Murray has done quite a bit of work, and I know others here have done as well in tomatoes and, and other plants. Um, I, I, I think what, what at least I thought was unique about our application was that if you use it at the single kernel NIR level and not using drones, you can actually make selection prior to take the plants to the field. And the environmental component of your NIR is actually restricted to a seed source, right? So it's not so much the, the field environment. So the, the idea is we have about a thousand wavelengths that the machine calculates for different absorbance. And you can treat each one as a phenotype, as a trait. And then we can use that set of traits to build a relationship matrix that will then be used to predict a certain phenotype. The, the best way that I could convince myself of how this could work, having twins myself, is an example like this. And some of you may know these two. I just Googled for the two most famous identical twins and <laughs> um, property brothers showed up. So, if I was to ask you, and this is a hypothetical example, what is the probability that Drew, who I have no idea who it is, let's say this is Drew, what's the probability that Drew is colorblind, given that Jonathan is colorblind? Um, and in our minds, we would use the morphological traits of the face to create a relationship and say they are, they are identical twins. So even though color blindness has no biology, biological relationship with any of those traits here, we can actually come up with a pretty good prediction in this extreme case, obviously, that if this guy is colorblind, this one probably is as well. So what I think is happening is the exact same thing. Where it's a case of indirect selection, which, again, if you have an index where the wavelengths are predicting a certain index, and we can then calculate the, the response to, of selection for the, the target trait when we select on the index. The response depends basically on what's the covariance between either the index or the, the individual traits with the, with the target trait. And the structure itself creates that covariance. So I think the key thing is that even though I'm not suggesting that a certain wavelength in the kernel has anything to do with flowering time, but it turns out that there is a positive or negative correlation of these wavelengths with traits that go to the field. So I can see, for example, I actually don't have flower, oh, flowering time here, but anyways, I'll, I'll add this to pollination. And you can see that you have uh, non-zero values that can then capture, have some predictive power. And, and the way we looked into this, so we had about 600 individuals. We, calc we had a bunch of phenotypes in the field. We said, okay, let's just try out. Let's do cross-validation prediction, take one set out, and see how much the NIR can predict some of these traits. And so here is three years of data, and just some of the traits, DTPs, days of pollination, year height, year length, germination, which is the best, but definitely is associated with kernel composition, right? It has, uh, um, and then plant height and tip fill. And the accuracy's value vary, but I, I was pretty excited to see some of them are, are fairly high, and it seems like we can actually achieve some predictive power for traits that are non-correlated with kernel composition uh, in three different years in, in this data set. So the first question that came to mind is like, well, how much of that am I just predicting the environment? This is just seed source. And while we haven't calculated yet the heritability of the index or heritability of each wavelength, we did had data from NIR data collected in, from, from different seeds, the same materials, the same genetics, but seeds then generated in two different years. So what I'm showing here are the phenotypes are coming from these three different individual years, but the NIR data is coming from 2019 independently in 2020. So they're the same genotypes, but I'm testing whether or not all of the predictive power is coming from just a seed source, a seed lot, uh, and, and that doesn't seem to be the case. So basically, 
NIR from both years were able to predict phenotype in all in, in phenotypes of all three years. Um, so um, I, I wanted to convince myself a little bit more of that. And we had a set of the age lines that had never gone to the field. So those were now a little bit more of the application. So these are unphenotyped the ages. And we just ran the prediction model. So whatever we had calibrated for the population, we predicted germination for these the ages. And I planted in the field. The students gave me a hard time because there's no experimental design here. I just planted the ones that were predicted to be low germinators in a block and the ones that were predicted to be high germinators in the other block. Trust me, this is pretty homogeneous, but we'll repeat that with wraps. <laughs> um, but it, it seems to work pretty well. That, and, and, and I think at the very least, if I can just rule out whether it's genetics or environment, the DHs that will never make it in, in our nurseries, that in itself is already a pretty interesting game. But what, what was also really cool to see is that when we combine both of them, a kernel for genomic selection and a kernel for genomic selection in the same linear model, um, we actually get uh, every single case of them. And just to be clear, this population is different than the population that I initially showed, the, the GS results. So this is more, it's the diversity population. So it, there's a lot more uh, diversity. And then you can see the GS accuracies are also lower. Uh, but it turns out that in every case, when I combine in cross-validation, when I combine GS with PS, I get a little bit of a bump. And it seems like the bump is higher. I'm capturing more of the predictions when I have fewer markers. So these are unimputed markers, but it just makes the point that potentially if I have low density panels plus phenomic selection, I can actually recoup a lot of that prediction. So I think that was a quick summary about, about phenomic selection. And, and uh, I still want to get myself a little bit more convinced in some of our more advanced lines. This doesn't work very well with, with uh, hybrid seeds as you're predicting the maternal tissue. So it has to be used mostly in inbreds. Uh, but I, I think to the point of this slide, either to select the ages or if we can actually select within segregating F2s in a selfing program, if you think about it, I generally generate uh, four, five, six hundred uh, seeds from a self of a hybrid. And these are, are a, a segregating F2, right? Some of those will go to the field. And usually it's just a random selection of 25, 50 seeds. You open up the packet and get a few and take it to the field. So any positive gain that I can have here is basically free gain ish right it's just the cost of running the machine so i'm pretty excited with this and we'll continue to explore how much time do i have just sorry okay i can cover that and so the the last project that i wanted to touch base is um is one that builds very much in what john luke has worked in the past and others but it goes back to how to select uh how to better select in, in my initial scheme that i've shown what to cross using genomic selection and not only rank the best inbreds but really guide what to cross uh, within the heterotic group and we started working on this this uh, marco is a postdoc in my lab now igor went to to uh, uh to work for this for a seed company but the, the Sioux we started working in the in in the lab a few years ago exploring these new simulation tools which honestly are Quite exciting because you can simulation exists for decades but i think nowadays it keeps getting more and more advanced to where you can actually simulate a more realistic breeding program in my mind so i've shown you already one of the simulations where we just simulated genomic selection but if you think about the the rationale it's well known that genomic selection if you if you don't pay attention how to deploy genomic selection it's well known that your genetic variability drops quite rather quickly and this is just an example where we simulated the, the selection of the best lines unconstrained by anything, just get the best lines and move forward in the program. And quite quickly, your genetic variance drops. Uh, so, so Marco ended up creating this, this R package, Simple Mating, which is already available. And hopefully the, the GitHub will be published this week, I hope. Um, but 
the the idea was if you think about it it it, it it's an optimization pro problem so we want to maximize genetic gain right that's what everybody wants to do but if possible and if genomic data allows it we want to constrain on just relationship as a measure of the future diversity um, right so the way we were interested in approaching this is uh, you can you can do that looking at progeny means and predicted progeny means from from um, from your genomic selection but we were interested in, in since you have genomic data and start looking into the concept of usefulness and again others many others have looked into this the concept itself was proposed back in 1975 but the idea of usefulness is that you can unite two concepts, genetic mean and the genetic variance of the future progeny that will be generated by that cross. So you want to create crosses that the inbreds have good predicted mean, but that will also generate the DHs or, or, or your selfing program will generate um, large enough variance so that you can select there. So, Using genomic data, we can actually calculate and estimate usefulness. And you can estimate that for additives, for dominance. And what I think what we added that others had not done yet was to add a multi-trait usefulness. That if you think about a vegetable breeding program, yield is important, but there is a ton of other traits that are important as well. So basically, the package will create a, a list of all possible crosses and then a, a, a estimation of what is the variance for that future cross, what is the variance for the mean, and then what's the usefulness for that cross. And that's the first step, and you can use either an additive genomic model, a dominant, an additive and dominance genomic model, or an additive multi-trait and an additive dominance multi-trait model. And once you do that, here is the list of crosses. We can go and constrain Let's not make just the top ones. Let's constrain them based on uh, inbreeding, right? So there, there is a few functions that will go and create what is the mate plan that constrains what is the future inbreeding that's expected to be generated from those crosses. So, so far, we've only tested this in simulation. And, and again, I think this concept of mate pair allocation is not new. Many others have, have done bef before. Um, we wanted to just get a little bit more into it and, and explore how well we would fit into our program. So, so far in simulation, what we did is look into a, a, a program that had been published before, which is no longer sweet corn, but a regular field corn program where you have the two heterotic groups and you're just basically selecting on both sides of it and selecting on the hybrids. And, and we compare basically truncated selection, the implementation of genomic selection, and then the implementation of the, of the cross selection. And I won't go through all the details here, but I think that the three lines to focus are the dashed lines. Uh, and, and I think the message here is that you do get a little bit of gain. It's not a ton, but honestly, it's gain that's using the same amount of information that you would from genomic selection. So it's virtually free gain. Um, and you get a, a significant reduction, or, or it doesn't reduce as much the genetic variability over time. So basically, this is a breeding program that was simulated for 20 years. And, and then this is the loss of gen uh, genetic variance over time. And one of the things I wanted to see is how correlated were the selections based on usefulness and based on just progeny mean. And they're pre-correlated, but not one. So here's a case where the same 20 years were ran. Every year we selected based on usefulness, but we checked what was the correlation of the usefulness values and the progeny mean, just the regular uh, mid parental average values. And over time, for both cases, as you start depleting diversity, basically that correlation decreases. So this basically lower correlation is what's creating this increased gain. And so, yeah, I think these are just a few projects that we're working on, and 
I have a few other stories that maybe are, are either not fully developed enough or um, Raksha is a PhD student working with crop growth models in potatoes. Uh, Gabriela is also a PhD student wor working with single cell RNA seq in maize. And there are a few other things out there. Uh, Mariana has, has some projects on KMER based UAS and hopefully some PhD that we will discuss. But overall, I just there's a there's a lot of people involved in in, in all of this, and, and I want to thank everybody in funding. And happy to take any questions. That was the only picture I could find that had corn and potato. It's, it's not mine. I didn't take this picture. I'll go ahead and pass. Oh. Go ahead if you want. Um, uh, in your corn uh, hybrids, do you make the hybrids uh, yourself or do you give the inbreds to the company to make the hybrids? Then do they send you back the hybrid seed or how does that work? So the question, can they hear it? The, the question was whether I, I create my the hybrids between the company material and, and ours ourselves or if we send to the companies. There's a little bit of both and it depends on which company we're working with. Some of them, we have an MTAs where, MTAs where they send their inbreds and we use their inbreds to create the hybrids. Some basically is the other way around. So we send our inbreds, they create the hybrids and they send to us. If they choose one of your inbreds, do they pay your royalties? Yes. So uh, Florida has a, has a pre, uh, I think it's, a, it's an excellent model. Back in the 90s, the breeders got together and so there was license, tech licensing for other things like Gatorade. And then they said, okay, and their inventors got paid a, a, a certain amount. So the breeders went there and negotiated and said, we as inventors want to get less as long as more of the varieties get invested back in the program. So generally speaking, it depends, there's some cutoffs, but generally speaking, 70% of the royalties get invested back in the breeding program. And that creates the motivation for a lot of the variety development and, and and then there is a foundation that is responsible for doing this, all these processes. So, yeah. yeah, great presentation, really enjoyed it. So for someone that works on two different organisms in terms of their, their breeding program, how has like the flow of information that you have now more of an understanding of their biology go you know, in between the two species or has there kind of been a brick wall between there, or are you able to learn from, from each and, and it kind of flows by direction? Yeah, so the question is, have, with us working in two different uh, species, has there, is there overlap in learning, a learning process or they're very separate? Um, the breeding processes are very different, right? And I think, there is one aspect of breeding, which is working with growers and thinking about the variety development itself. And I think that there's definitely shared uh, aspects there that things I learned in corn and I, I'm, learned, I'm using in potato now. But specifically in the technical process, I think, I don't think necessarily the, that there is a lot of overlap when it comes to the biology itself. But for example, having seen the results in phenomic selection in corn, I now want to go and try it in potato and run a handheld NIR and, and, and cut potato and see if I can get any predict, predictive power. So I think there's definitely a learning. A lot of why I put that first slide on the zigzag, I talk a lot about my students that in lab meetings, for example, how to make sure that both groups keep engaged because they're hearing from different crops. And, and, and that's a bit sometimes a challenge and something that I, I, I encourage them to do, uh, and, and we try to then go back to the methods and the aspects of how breeding efficiency is being achieved regardless of the crop. Um, but yeah, I think there's still some aspects that are unique. Yeah, it was, you know, the, the, the kernel NIR with like ear height, uh, what do you think is gonna happen? Like if you were to actually care about ear height and select on it in a year or two, Gonna, should go away, right? Um, so, yes, but but I must say that the challenge with vegetable breeding is that you have too many traits. So we do care about ear height because all the harvest in Florida is hand harvest. So if the year is too high, the crew basically doesn't want to harvest that, that hybrid. So in principle, yes, but the reality is that while you're 
selecting for 20 other traits, the gain in each specific individual trait is limited. So I think it would take more than two seasons to fix. Uh, I showed you the, the data on germination, which is the more obvious one that it has direct, but it's in the field now. We also made selections on the tails of plant height, flowering, and, and ear height predicted from NIR. And then we're planting not only the inbreds, but also we generate hybrids, test cross hybrids from these inbreds. And we'll see if we get any, if the method really works, right? If it goes to the hybrid and, and there's any differences in the tails of the prediction, um, we'll see. Do you ever do your cross validation where you're dropping out whole families, whole crosses? So for, for all the data here that I was showing was in the diversity population. So the, there, the structure was not at the family level, but more into that phylogeny that I showed in the beginning where we did not drop a full cluster out, but there, there aren't any families in there. Well, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.